This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Well, I mean, I think it's probably fair to say that most of Alan's work actually reflects that interest and is on the north of England, which yes. makes uh, today's talk on um, the heathlands of the south east, of what we can only really describe as the south, greater south east. Um, some perhaps slightly unexpected and certainly in this world, but uh, I'm delighted to uh, listen to you and talk about it because this is also the scene of my commute uh, <laughs> every morning. Um, crosses what, what, what is and was the uh, Surrey, Berkshire, and Hampshire, Hampshire, Ethan. Um, so, if, sorry. So, I think at this point, we'll, we'll, we probably attract as many speakers as will fit in the room whatsoever. Uh, we should probably begin and uh, over to you. Okay, thanks. So. Well, I ought to explain, perhaps, since I've lived in Preston since the early 1980s, why I'm talking about Berkshire, Surrey, and Hampshire. I was actually born and bred in Woking. Um, now, it's not something you say when you live in Lancashire, <laughs> it's, it's a sort of dangerous uh, statement that. My parents were exiled Lancastrians, my mother has lived in Woking since 1949, has the broadest Mancunian accent that you could possibly wish to hear, and has not gone native. So I grew up um, literally within sight of the Heathlands, and one of the abiding memories of childhood was hearing the distant sound of warfare and my mother saying, ah, they're firing at Bisley. Um, this was one of the sort of sounds of childhood, the, the, the firing, the thud of the um, munitions on the ranges. So it's always interested me uh, as a landscape because it's one I knew very well from childhood. Uh, but more recently it's interested me as a landscape because it's a landscape which has to a very considerable extent, disappeared. <coughs> uh, a landscape which over the past 200 years has steadily been eroded in its geographical extent and has been transformed in its physical form to produce uh, a, a, a fragmented and piecemeal landscape where once there was uh, a, a very extensive and continuous stretch of heathland and it's the disappearance of that landscape which is a particularly I think a particularly interesting historical story um, that an area of in round figures 100,000 acres uh, only 20 odd miles from central London could disappear almost entirely and be transformed almost entirely with almost nobody raising any comment about that process uh, and in very marked contrast and I think it's important to place it in this contrast in very marked contrast to the fate of for example Epping Forest or Burnham Beaches <coughs> where in the mid 19th century um, some of the earliest elements of what became the conservation movement were generated in protest at the threatened disappearance of those tracts of woodland. Um, so in some parts of that outer ring around London, there was a very active and dynamic conservation movement in the mid-Victorian period. Yet in this area, same distance out from London, equally untouched, as it were, the uh, voices were never raised at all. Indeed, quite the opposite. There was a very strong campaign against the Heathland, a uh, strong campaign towards its division and its exploitation. The best place to begin, in one sense, is with Daniel Defoe. Um, highly unreliable in some ways, but his tour through the whole island of Great Britain, which appeared in sort of part work in the uh, mid-1720s, uh, mid um, unreliable in the sense that it pretends to be a travel log, but it clearly wasn't necessarily uh, an actual journey. Uh, it gives a wonderful polemic about the heathland, and this is the first detailed, it's not a detailed description in the landscape sense, but it's the first detailed statement about the contemporary perspective upon the heathlands. From Farnham, that I might take in the whole county of Surrey, 
I took the coach road over Bagshot Heath, and that great forest, as tis called, of Windsor. Those that despise Scotland and the north part of England for being full of waste and barren land may take a view of this part of Surrey and look upon it as a foil to the beauty of the rest of England, or a mark of just resentment showed by heaven upon the Englishman's pride. I mean the pride they show in <coughs> boasting of their country, its fruitfulness, pleasantness, richness, the fertility of the soil. Whereas here is a vast tract of land, some of it within 17 or 18 miles of the capital, which is not only poor, but even quite sterile, given up to barrenness, horrid and frightful to look on. Not only good for little, but good for nothing. Much of it is a sandy desert, and one may frequently be put in mind here of Arabia Deserta, where the winds raise the sands so as to overwhelm whole caravans of travellers, cattle and people together. For in passing this heath on a windy day, I was so far in danger of smothering with the clouds of sand which were raised by the storm that I could neither keep it out of my mouth, nose or eyes. And when the wind was over, the sand appeared spread over the adjacent fields. And then he goes on to say that even the highlands of Scotland are not so barren as this landscape around Bagshot. And that the ground is otherwise so poor and barren that the product of it feeds no creatures but some very small sheep who feed chiefly on the said heather, and but few of these, and nor are there any villages worth remembering, and but few houses, or people for many miles far and wide. This desert lies extended so much that some say there is not less than a 100,000 acres of this barren land. And that's the sort of landscape which we're thinking about. This is one of the relatively few parts of this immense tract of heathland which still survives in something approximating to what must have been its form, its character, in the early 18th century when Defoe observed it. A landscape uh, of bleakness and barrenness as it was perceived in the 18th century and remained perceived in that way for generations to come. The area we're talking about, oops, no. Oh dear, come along, come along, move on. Why won't you do that? No, Adam, sort me out. Where are we going? That's better. This is the area we're talking about. This is the, uh, the core, as it were, of the heathlands. Uh, we have Surrey here, the county boundary running there. We have Berkshire to the north of the county boundary here, along the river Blackwater. And we have North East Berkshire <coughs> down there. And in round figures, 100,000 acres, uh, which occupies, as you can see from that, uh, an area spanning the three county boundaries and lying, certainly in historical terms, between the key arteries, the key routeways of the Thames Valley to the north and the valley of the River Way to the southeast. So this is the sort of wedge of territory between the two major river valleys. And that um, location between the two valleys helps to some extent to explain its perceived remoteness in the early 18th century. The Thames as a navigable waterway and the way made navigable from 1653 were significant commercial arteries, but nothing crossed the heathlands in the centre. And what's striking about that map, I suppose, uh, and we'll come to this again, is that many of the place names there are very familiar because Woking, for example, or Frimley and Camberley, Aldershot, uh, those are places which have become, in more recent years, major towns, towns of very great importance. 
But at the time when this description by Defoe was written, these were extremely small rural villages. The population of Woking in 1801 was only just over a thousand for the whole parish. So this is a very thinly populated area. And those descriptions by people like Defoe do not exaggerate the emptiness of that landscape. In 1801, in the whole of that area shown in colour on the map, there were only about 14,000 people. So a very thinly populated area with very small villages um, without any sort of substantial built-up area at all. Topographically, <coughs> as I've already suggested, we have the Way Valley down to the southeast, the river flowing north through the gap at Guildford, <coughs> and then broadening out and widening towards the Thames at Walton and Weybridge. And then to the north we have the Thames Valley. And the heathlands themselves characterised by a succession of ridges. And those ridges were the most prominent physical feature, particularly <coughs> the north-south ridge, which runs from just south of Bracknell, through Camberley, Herbright is here, down towards the Hog's Back. There is a gap between the Hog's Back here and the main ridge. And rising just southeast, uh, southwest of Aldershot, to around 550 feet above sea level. So in southeastern terms, a relatively distinctive topography. And that topography, very important in helping to shape what subsequently becomes the development of the heathlands. And the extent of the heath in detail is first clearly mapped reliably mapped by the Ordnance Survey in the decade after 1810. The first one-inch map of the area was published in 1816, and here we see in detail the extent of the heathland. All of the brown on this map is heathland or common land in 1816. And you can see the great uninterrupted swathe, which extends from Chobham and what is now Virginia Water, round <coughs> south of Bracknell, over towards Crowthorne and Wokingham, and then down in that great band along the ridge, uh, southwards to Purbright here, broken only by a very narrow valley of the River Blackwater, and then a second great swathe of heathland. Uh, north of Aldershot, Farnborough, Fleet, and up to Yateley. Um, so it is an immense area. Uh, I come back to that statistic which Defoe quotes, and which is uh, reliable, that there is about 100,000 acres of more or less empty space at the beginning of the 18th century, and that much of that empty space survives into the beginning of the 19th century. And then fairly rapidly, it largely disappears. The contemporary descriptions um, from the later 18th century are those which were afforded us by the agricultural improvers, those who, particularly in the 1790s under the auspices of the Board of Agriculture, undertook the county surveys, which are such an important if not necessarily always reliable source for the nature of agriculture during the Napoleonic Wars. And they are unanimously hostile to this area because, of course, this is the very antithesis of agricultural improvement. This is an immense area of unimproved wasteland, which not only is unimproved, but which, even to the most optimistic agricultural improvers, clearly was going to present major challenges to those who sought to turn it into productive agricultural land. William James and John Malcolm, in their 1794 survey of the agriculture of Surrey, were absolutely scathing, echoing Defoe's polemical writing 
of the 1720s. <coughs> Upon traversing these cold and exposed wastes, we saw only a few starved animals, unworthy of the name of sheep. <coughs> Certain it is that no animal can live long upon these wastes in their present state. And William Marshall, in his Agricultural Economy of Southern England, which appeared in 1798, was equally hostile. The present produce, if it deserves the name, is a sort of dwarfish, stunted heath. Uh, in many uh, places, unable to hide the sand on which it may be said to starve. On a general view of this extensive tract of country, there will be little risk in saying that it is in its present state the most unprofitable to the community of any district of equal extent in the whole island. The mountains on the northwest coast of Scotland perhaps accepted. So this extreme view is uh, tangibly uh, expressed in the sense of a resentment against nature that it should have been so hard and cruel as to create a landscape like this, so close to London. And that becomes a, a key element in the attitudes to the landscape and what happens to the landscape, that its proximity to London is a source of particular resentment, a particular anger against the fate which has created this landscape. The agricultural writers optimistically, because it was their job, expressed the view that with suitable draining, suitable manuring, suitable ploughing and so forth, this could be turned into productive agricultural land. But there's a strong sense that they really hadn't got much faith in their own statements about this. And when you look at this example, this is from Chobham Common, you can see precisely why it would have taken the most optimistic of improvers to perceive that that landscape could really be turned into anything worthy of the name of farmland. What they don't tell us, of course, because it's not part of their agenda, is about the 14,000 or so people who lived in those 24 parishes which formed the core of the heathland. We don't learn very much at all about how the local community, because a community there was, albeit small, how that had adapted to and made use of the landscape that we see here. Because clearly this is not waste in the sense which they were intending it to be meant. This is not useless land. This is land which has a value, which has an economic significance for local people. And the more honest of the agricultural improvers, or those looking perhaps beyond the remit of simple improvement messages towards a more descriptive uh, analysis of the landscape, the more uh, ambitious of them perhaps did point to the resources which could be exploited on the heathlands. So for example, Charles Vancouver, in his uh, agricultural uh, description of the county of Hampshire, uh, which was published in 1810, uh, does observe that in the area around Aldershot and Farnborough and up towards uh, what is later to be the town of Fleet, that there were substantial peat reserves which were exploited by local people, that peat was the most significant fuel for local people in that largely treeless waste. And that in the parish of Cove, he says, where the largest bodies of peat uh, were to be found, it was used as a fuel for local potteries. So we begin to get other layers of description um, layers which tell us about, and we can over-sentimentalise this, but I think it's worth thinking about, local communities which were in harmony with their environment, which were able in fairly subtle ways to exploit the, albeit relatively limited, resources of the heathlands. Others note that brushwood and thatching materials were cropped from the heaths and the commons, that the women in areas such as Bagshot and Windlesham 
had a sort of cottage industry, a craft industry, in cropping brushwood from the heaths and turning it into brushes and besoms which they could sell to nearby towns. That cottagers made use of the winberries and other fruit, uh, the, 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 the products of the heath itself, um, both for sale and for domestic consumption. Um, that there were um, a whole series of minor trades and minor occupations which relied upon the heath. But most importantly, of course, that it provided the rough grazing for the agricult agricultural communities on the margins of the heathland itself. And those polemical descriptions of the scrawny, half-starved sheep um, quite consciously and quite deliberately negative and pejorative conceal the fact that these impoverished agricultural communities valued the heathland very highly for the very extensive free grazing which it offered. And I think it's probably true to say, although almost certainly unprovable, that much of the landscape of the heath, which was described by Defoe and by his successors later in the 18th century, is actually the product of many generations of intensive sheep grazing that it has produced um, by the early 18th century, a sort of ecological disaster in a way, that intensive sheep grazing, suppressing the natural regrowth of woodland and exposing as here the um, very thin soils had perpetuated the barrenness of the landscape, uh, a classic sort of situation which we can now recognise. So, a landscape which was detested, just occasionally, even at the end of the 18th century, there are glimpses of future attitudes, uh, almost exclusively people are negative, people are hostile. But uh, in the 1830s, for example, in Braley's History of Surrey, it was very perceptively noted that the heathlands of the western part of the county, uh, from Woking across what became Camberley up towards Bagshot, afford the cottagers opportunity for healthy recreation, denied to the population of counties wholly enclosed and therefore hinting at what potentially was going to become a major role of the heathlands as a recreational area, as a, an open space, a lung for the great Wen and the growing towns on its periphery. That, however, was a minority view. Just a couple more pictures, just to illustrate the, the extraordinary sort of difficulties that the agricultural improvers were faced with. This is uh, a couple of years ago, of course, but the landscape that we see here, the sparsity of vegetation, the thinness or almost complete absence of soil, is something that was extensively commented on in the early 19th century, and there's no reason to think that it was significantly different from what we see today. And this is near Aldershot, and the orange sands there uh, <coughs> betoken the iron pan, which becomes <coughs> one of the um, features that the early geological writers uh, describe uh, very extensively. Iron pan, which to some of them offered the opportunity or potential for um, an iron industry actually trying to smelt the thin iron pan beds in the sandstones around Aldershot, Camberley and Purbright, um, highly over-optimistic, not least because of the absence of any decent fuel, let alone the fact that iron pan is not a good ore. But the whole message in this sort of period, 1790 through to the 1830s, is that if only somebody would get their act together and invest in this area, if only people would galvanise themselves into action, these heathlands could become more productive. They could cease to be a blot on the landscape. They could cease to be an insult imposed by nature. And they could be converted into something more verdant and more productive 
the ideal, the ambition of the agricultural improver. And the consequence of the iron pan, these are just sort of pretty landscape shots, I suppose. Um, poor drainage. Uh, so we have a paradox of uh, a soil which is sand, where there's almost no surface water, which is intermingled with areas, substantial areas of bog, uh, and peat bog, and poor drainage. So a landscape which is at once uh, waterlogged and yet desiccated, um, again contributing to the major challenges for improvers. If we then turn to uh, the more detailed maps <coughs> which we have, detailed maps which date uh, in both counties of Berkshire and Surrey from <coughs> the 1760s and John Roke's One Inch to the Mile surveys, we see what is also something much described by contemporary observers, the contrast between the blackness of the heath and the verdant greenness of the river valleys on either side. Uh, a number of writers in the years uh, around 1800, 1820, describe journeys, either real or imagined, through the heathlands, where the sense of relief from passing from the bleak, black barrenness of the heathland to the hedges and the lawns and the village greens of the lands on either side is a palpable sense of deliverance from danger and insecurity. These were terrifying areas. These were areas shunned by respectable and civilised persons that you galloped through or rattled through on your carriage as fast as you possibly could. And the map makers sort of exemplify that. Um, this is Roke's map of Surrey, um, hand coloured by me, um, but showing this sort of contrast between the greenness and the emptiness. Now this becomes a very important message in the agricultural writer's thinking, but it also becomes a very important theme in the thinking of those who are planning transport improvements. And when we begin to think about how the heathlands start to disappear, the catalyst to change, or one of the major catalysts to change, is the emergence in the middle of the 18th century of the first thinking about transport networks. Now, I, that's a gross <coughs> oversimplification. But the, the message which is increasingly familiar from looking at the history of the canal networks, of the railway networks, is that the heathlands being waste, being to most people's intents and purposes superfluous wasteland of no value whatsoever, are also exceptionally cheap land. And therefore, the cheapness of the land becomes a positive attraction to those who are planning transport projects. And we'll turn to that again, but it's very important to think about this. This is Woking Heath. Round about here, just north of the G of Woking, is now Woking Station, at the very heart of a town of 100,000 people. In the 1760s, 1762, when this map was made, there was not a building in sight at the location of what was to be Woking Railway Station. And it's that absolutely total transformation which is one of the most striking features of this story. It's not about slow and steady growth. It's not about the expansion of the small miniature town of Woking down there. It's about the superimposition of a complete new urban landscape almost literally in the middle of nowhere. <coughs> so this isn't about organic urban growth. This is about a completely radical change in the landscape itself. I'm skipping forward a bit uh, for time reasons, but just to reiterate the emptiness of it, around here are the medieval and later markets, um, some of them familiar places, Medieval market towns of major significance, places like Church, Sea Reading, 
Wokingham, Guildford, Farnham. Others, uh, the smaller circles, those which were either abortive or dwindled away in the medieval period, and the two purple ones, Maidenhead and Woking, those which were established in the 17th or late 16th and 17th centuries as new market speculations. And here we have, therefore, a ring of towns, all of which look outwards from the heath, all of which look away from the heath. This isn't as though the heath is the focus of their hinterlands, the focus of their activity. The heath is the empty space which they shun. So they look outwards in that direction, northwards, eastwards, southwards, westwards, but not into the centre, that empty space in the middle. And then across that empty space, in the middle decades of the 18th century, begins the process of transformation with the development first of the turnpike network. Network, of course, is a slight misnomer. There's no planning or no, over, uh, no, no sort of um, overriding design <coughs> for this. But the piecemeal creation of the turnpike system has an immediate effect upon the landscape of the heathlands, beginning with the turnpiking of what is now the A30, coming down from London via Staines towards Bagshot, and then extending in the late 1730s down towards Basingstoke as the great new road, or the great improved road to the west. And then extending from that Bagshot down to Farnham and heading down towards Winchester in the 1750s, and likewise from Ascot along through Wokingham to Reading at the end of the 1750s. So when Defoe in the 1720s trundles slowly across the sandstorm blasted heaths of Bagshot, uh, 40 years later, a much quicker journey is possible. It becomes possible to cross the heaths far more easily. But no less significant is that in the northern part of the heathlands, the new turnpike roads make it possible for, in effect, commuting to begin. The improvement of the roads themselves and the improvement of their services means that for the wealthy elite, it becomes possible to consider living in East Berkshire and North, North West Surrey and to travel into town once or twice a week. This is not regular commuting, this is not a daily grind, it's, it's a much more, um, much more elite and indulgent form of commuting. But we see the impact of this from the 1750s. It is very striking indeed that the 1728 turnpike, the Bagshot turnpike, and the branch which leads off to Wokingham form, as it were, the focus of a new generation of country houses uh, which appear in the 1750s, in particularly East Berkshire. And in the Atlas of Berkshire history, uh, which this is shamelessly taken from, uh, you can see here the purple dots, the purple circles, are the new country houses which are established, creating um, parkland landscapes carved out of the edge of the heath with uh, fashionable country houses for uh, what are often, I mean, this is not unique to Berkshire, but the nabobs of the East India Company and people such as that. Benefiting from, this sounds like an estate agent's blur, <laughs> benefiting from proximity to Windsor, um, Windsor in the mid 18th century, distinctly unfashionable, shunned by George II, not popular, but in the late 18th century, when George III begins his hugely expensive and ambitious program of rebuilding Windsor and also of remodelling the park with model farms, we have massive investment and the hangers on, the camp followers, those who wish to be near albeit the unglamorous court of George III, uh, begin to found their country houses in East Berkshire, close to the turnpike roads. So what we get here in the second half of the 18th century 
is an absolutely fundamental change in attitude. The heathlands, which have been so shunned, so despised, so loathed by all thinking people because of their bleakness, barrenness, etc., become, because of reasons of fashion, desirable places to live. Not the heathlands themselves, but the parklands and the landscapes that can be created from the heathlands. It's very difficult to grow wheat on the heathlands, but by the late 18th century it's very easy to grow rhododendrons and azaleas and to landscape in the fashionable new mode. By happy chance, the difficult soils, the bleak environment, the thin and sparse nourishments that the heathlands offer are absolutely perfect for the fashionable new styles of ornamental gardening with imported species. So we have a complete turnaround in fortunes, beginning in the areas around Ascot and Sunning Hill and Sunning Dale, that sort of heartland of highly exclusive suburbia. And beginning, in fact, with Virginia Water, uh, laid out from 1753 as the first major piece of conscious re-landscaping, um, damming the small and boggy stream that flowed along the edge of the heathlands, creating what was at the time the largest man-made lake in the country. And Virginia Water acting as the social focus as well as the landscape focus for the new elite in their near enough town but not near town residences. The turnpike providing the key, the access route into London. So we have the beginnings of a fundamental change that takes place because of particularly the improvements of the road network. And then, jumping forward, Sorry, there. We have, uh, following in the 1790s, the construction of the Basingstoke Canal, um, one of the less uh, illustrious canal ventures, um, which was never commercially a success, <laughs> but was laid out quite deliberately to cross the heathlands. And here again you see Woking Heath with the canal running across the heath itself. Um, very, very little of the canal actually goes through or went through uh, normal farmland. In the 23 miles from the way navigation at Byfleet through to Church Crookham near Fleet, only two miles was actually through farmland. All the rest was across heathland, which could be bought for rock-bottom prices at bargain rates, and the awkward route of the canal shunning any possible source of trade, it would seem, almost <laughs> perversely, was determined for that reason, because the land was so extraordinarily cheap. And the intention was, and all canal prospectuses were madly ambitious, but the intention was that the uh, chalk reserves in the area around Greywell and Basingstoke would be quarried alongside the canal, sent down the canal towards London, and would then be used as top dressing to sweeten the soils of areas like Woking Heath and Aldershot Heath. Um, in return, once those areas had become productive agricultural land, um, there would be the generation of a great deal of business selling agricultural produce to London. Uh, neither of these things actually happened, but the Basingstoke Canal's route, taking it through the heathlands, uh, actually has uh, an unintended longer-term consequence, which we'll come to in a moment. The canal was uh, finally opened at the beginning of the 19th century, and pursued a sort of meandering career, um, far less profitable, mostly unprofitable, uh, didn't fulfil the ambitions of the speculators. 
And then in 1838 comes the London and Southampton Railway Company. The original route for the London and Southampton Railway, its original proposals, its prospectus of 1831, 1832, took a very logical route from London through Esher, down to Guildford, and then Farnham, Alton, Alsford to Winchester, connecting a sequence of ma major market towns on a relatively direct route. Um, that route was then abandoned, and the reason for its abandonment was the same as the reason for the routing of the Basingstoke Canal, uh, namely that the land was too expensive. Good quality farmland down through southwest Surrey into Hampshire, the Itchin Valley, uh, that was too expensive. Um, instead, taking a route which took as far as possible a straight line from London to Basingstoke. Basingstoke to be the jumping off point for the ambitious plan to serve Bristol, uh, which never came about, and also to get down to the southwest. But more particularly in the short term, taking a route which, as far as possible, passed across the heathlands. And this is much better documented than the Basingstoke Canal um, proposal. It's very clear that landowners, lords of the manor who had the heathlands, all down through Surrey and Hampshire, found the prospect of selling to the railway company um, impossible to resist. This useless land, this unproductive land, this unremunerative land, could be converted, or stripped of it, could be converted for sale to the railway company. And here is Woking Common Railway Station, in 1838, just after the opening of the line, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the heath, nothing around, no buildings visible apart from Horsel Church on the ridge away to the north. And it's there which was to be the centre of the eventual town of Woking. And the railways which followed likewise <coughs> passed through the heathlands. And it's very striking. When you look at the map of these railways, the routes that they take, time and again, thread their way through the edges of the heathlands, not taking necessarily the most direct and the most logical route. They chop the heathland up into what later become manageable portions for speculative development and sale. But the routeways are very, very clearly determined by the availability of that cheap and, as it's perceived, useless land. So we've got the London and South West of the London and Southampton Railway. This was the original route down through Farnham to Alton. This is the replacement route, the land prices for which were far cheaper. And even today, as you see, substantial stretches of these lines still run through the open heathland that's, that survives. So, let's just briefly pause. We're in the middle of the 19th century. We have a landscape which has changed or started to change through the process of transport improvement. We also have a landscape, and we'll jump back here, which has changed in other ways through uh, enclosure. Um, this is, again, from the uh, History Atlas of Berkshire, and this shows the dating of the enclosure acts. And as you can see, the whole of East Berkshire, just about, is affected by enclosure acts at the beginning of the 19th century, the Great Winds Forest Act of 1813 and a whole series of successor acts for individual parishes around Sandhurst and Sunningdale, um, gradually attempting at least to implement agricultural improvement through the enclosure process. The reality, however, very different. The same pattern would be discernible in Hampshire and in Surrey, but as contemporaries wrote in the 1840s and 50s, the agricultural enclosure movement had been largely redundant in this area. 
because even though the acts were passed and the land was parcelled out, almost nothing had been done to plough and improve. And in Windlesham, for example, which was enclosed from uh, 1820 onwards, Windlesham in northwest Surrey, uh, within five years, the divisions, the allotments of land, were being turned over to the planting of conifers rather than to agricultural improvement in the conventional sense, almost instantly after enclosure had taken place. It was realised that there was virtually no hope of actually creating good quality land. And turning it over to tree planting and conifers in particular seemed the only option. At Woodham, between Woking and Chertsey, where agriculture, uh, where enclosure took place in 1805, it was noted in the 1840s that the only effective enclosure had been the planting of woodland and that the soil was so bad that even much of the woodland had died in the intervening 30 years. So although enclosure was taking place, the reality was it didn't have a major or significant impact upon the landscape itself. But, sorry, once we have agricultural improvements of sorts beginning, once we have transport networks beginning to thread their way, so we have the opening up of the area to other forms of development. And this is where the social reforms of the 19th century play a very crucial role. The beginning of institutional development, this becomes the greatest focus of institutions anywhere in England. This barren, empty landscape is perfectly located and perfectly priced for the development of the great asylums and prisons, all the undesirables of Victorian society. So you have County Asylum at Brookwood, you have the convict prisons at Woking, we have the public schoolboys of Wellington College. We've got all the undesirables sort of shoved away into these lonely, barren landscapes because the land is enormously cheap and it's very convenient for London. It's got the sort of best of both worlds, I suppose. And the process begins with the development of Sandhurst in 1810 to 1812 in the latter part of the Napoleonic Wars when the government is moving creakingly and slowly and falteringly towards forms of improvement in the management and the training of the armed services and in particular the training of officers is seen as needing an overhaul and we have in 1810 to 1812, the purchase of an area of heathland in the parish of Sandhurst for the development of the, of the military college. And once Sandhurst is established in the late uh, later part of the Napoleonic <coughs> War, so the other military institutions begin to uh, accrete around it. So we have military training exercises on the heaths. It's recognised that these open areas of waste land are perfectly located for the summer camps, which the army increasingly implements as a major element in its training programme. And we have the next great crisis, the Crimean War, and the realisation that the army needs not just tinkering with, but absolutely fundamental overhaul in its training processes. And the death of the Duke of Wellington in 1852, the sort of reactionary heavy hand whose attitudes were those of the late 18th century, means that suddenly, from the summer of 1852, reform is in the air. And one of the first tasks of the new reformist army council is to begin the process of setting up first large-scale temporary camps and then within two or three years large-scale permanent camps for military training. And they light upon the empty space of Aldershot Heath uh, 
Aldershot has a population of about 800. Um, the land is bought for about a pound an acre. And by the 1890s, an entire new town has been created, as well as Britain's greatest army camp. And the Basingstoke Canal, meandering through the middle of the heath, has a burst of prosperity from 1854 <laughs> to 1859, as all the building materials for Aldershot are brought in. The directors rub their hands in glee, and then the army completes the first major phase of Aldershot. The trade drops off, and in 1870, the railway is built across there, and the canal sinks into a sort of muddy decay at that point. So Aldershot is created, and there you can see, just contrast those two maps. This is 1816, and this is the mid-1890s. And an entire town of about 30,000 people has materialised in only 30 years in the middle of the heathland. We cannot say that Aldershot is a shining example of urban development in any sense. Um, aesthetically, socially, etc., it represented a very considerable challenge. Socially, continues to do so. Aesthetically, I think, almost as bad as it ever was. But nonetheless, this is the first of the great urbanisation projects. Uh, a town which gathers its own momentum. Of course, originally it's built around the uh, army camp, eventually becomes big enough to become self-sustaining. While its marginally more posh northern neighbour, Farnborough, grows almost as quickly to a town of about 20,000 by 1890. So we've got urbanisation on a grand scale prompted by military use, but we also have the increasing annexation of the heathlands for other aspects of military exploitation. And as the late Victorian army reforms gather pace, and as artillery training in particular becomes a major element in the new system, so the army sees this empty heathland as the perfect opportunity, perfectly placed in bargain prices to develop military ranges. And the impact is very easy to see. All of these areas, this is the old heathland as it was in 1816, and all of these areas in the darker shade are those which by 1902 had been acquired by the armed forces. So in round figures, about 60% of the entire area of the heathland, as it had been in 1816, was in military ownership by 1902. And you'll see there as well the speckling of the map with institutions. There are others which were too small to <coughs> include on the map, but two convict prisons and an army barracks at Woking, the Surrey County Asylum at Brookwood, the Gordon Boys School at, at, um, at, at West End, the Albert Edward Orphanage, near Bagshot. Wellington School handily placed for Broadmoor, um, <laughs> institution for the criminally insane. <laughs> Military depots everywhere. When Wellington College was being established, um, it was established under the patronage of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, and it was intended for the orphan children of army officers. Um, it was begun in 1853 and opened in 1859. And the Times uh, went to town about the uh, appalling choice of site, which shows that even in the 1860s, the perceptions of the landscape had altered virtually not at all. On Saturday, Her Majesty inaugurated the public opening of this institution and consequently the bleak, inhospitable-looking moor on which the building has unfortunately been erected had for the first time such a busy aspect as was almost sufficient, almost sufficient, to give an air of animation even to a spot so desolate and cold. The selection of a spot so wild and so cheerless can only be accounted for by the fact 
that the 12 acres of land on which the college and its outbuildings stand was presented to the Wellington Memorial Fund free of charge. <laughs> and that, that absolutely abusive perception of the Heathlands carried on therefore. And that helps to explain, in fact it, it is fundamental to explaining why all this was possible. This is not Epping Forest with its verdant groves and its little streams and its glades. This is not Burnham Beaches and Stoke Poges and that sort of area. This is black, wild country. This is worse than Scotland. Imagine that. This is terrible, bleak territory. So no voices are raised in protest. Nobody cares that the military take over this landscape. Nobody cares that the undesirables of mid-Victorian England are plonked there in massive institutions. This is ripe for a particular form of development. A military institutional landscape is created with weirdnesses like Brookwood Cemetery on the edge of Woking, uh, Europe's largest cemetery, 400 acres, uh, bought for a few thousand pounds from the Lord of the Manor, Lord Onslow, and developed in a very attractive, very verdant style, with its own railway stations to take trains down from Waterloo. And here we have Wellington College, and here we have Broadmoor. And all of these places gobble up hundreds of acres of the heathland. And they transform the landscape in other ways. They cut off the arteries of communication that crisscrossed the heath. They closed off the ancient routeways. This is the ancient King's Highway from Reading to Guildford as it crosses the ridge near Purbright. Uh, it's, it's still known as the Old Guildford Road. But in 1902, when the last great military purchase took place, all rights of way across the heathlands were suppressed. And steadily, the landscape was taken over by military use, denied to local people. Not a tear was shed for the experiences of the cottagers, the, the poor of West Surrey of East Hampshire, of East Berkshire. It is astonishing to think, and I think it's genuinely the case, that in the early 18th century, this is one of the poorest parts of England, that the land was amongst the cheapest land in Europe, that the people were amongst the most impoverished, that agriculture was, and this is arguable, amongst the least progressive, if that's a suitable word to use. And it seems extraordinary that despite the military and the institutional developments of the mid-19th century, we can now say that this has some of the most expensive real estate in the whole world, that this is one of the most costly and expensive places to live. Now, the, the downtrodden, impoverished inhabitants of Virginia Water <laughs> in 1750 would, well, to say the least, be in very sharp contrast to the notion of poverty in Virginia water today. Uh, I suppose the sort of poverty where you only have four cars. It's that sort of extreme change. And the answer to why it becomes, despite all the unprepossessing military use of institutions, the answer as to why it becomes so expensive goes back to that crucial development of the transport network. This is outer suburban London, where you can, well, in theory, you can afford the train fares in to Waterloo. The London and South Western Railway Company from the 1860s is actively promoting long-distance commuting in order to generate business for, ro uh, for railways which went through the heathlands. It actively promotes the idea of herbs in rural and it means that towns like Woking and towns like Camberley grow as commuter settlements, uh, giving that trade to the railway companies and nicely meshing in with the fashionable landscaping, with the rhododendrons and the azaleas, with the leafy lawns and the shrubberies, which become the absolute hallmark 
and which John Betjeman so perfectly encapsulates in Conifer County of Surrey. Uh, the whole idea of the Camberley ethos and Betjeman's description of Camberley, the mushroomy smells of Camberley, where you go from your suburban railway station into your wooded retreat and then the next day you go up to Waterloo again, albeit rather slowly from Camberley. <laughs> and the consequence is this, rather murky, but there is the celestial city, my birthplace, there is Woking, seen across Chobham Common with its skeins of power lines, and just behind me is the roaring M3, which slices through, you can cross Chobham Common, took Defoe, how long? Several hours to cross Bagshot Heath. He could now do it, provided the roadworks weren't too bad, <laughs> in approximately three minutes. It's sliced up, it's chopped up, the heathlands have been despoiled and desecrated. And what we have left is those precious fragments which are now nature reserves, which are now recognised as sites of special scientific interest. But, and this is where I shall finish, all is not safe because this is green belt. Some of it is common land, but some of it is not. Some of it is still in active military use, but the military use is gradually dwindling. This is the sort of area which may yet see another phase in its steady destruction. The expansion of London, the constant pressure to release more land for housing, parts of the former heathlands are still vulnerable to development. We could not, I suppose, imagine what this must have been like 200 years ago. Imagine a world without Woking. I mean, <laughs> how terrible <laughs> would that be? Um, but, just occasionally, just briefly, for short stretches, <coughs> where we go to Chobham Common or Caesar's Camp around Aldershot, where there are some stretches of the former heathland which still survive, we can get at least a sense of that bleakness and that barrenness. And given that it's only 25 miles from Charing Cross, that is quite an achievement, I think, that there is an empty space like this at Chobham, that remains, perhaps, a small miracle. Thank you.